Welcome back to Presidents in Politics. I am one of your hosts, Professor Caleb McGee, joined by my fellow co-host, uh, former Congressman Ross. Uh, today we're going to talk about James Monroe, the fifth president and the last of the Virginia dynasty. Absolutely. Also uh, the last of the founding fathers. Yes, true. The last to fight in the Revolutionary War. Yes. And we can definitely talk about here in a minute his military career, a uh, very interesting military career. And he was, yeah, he... he Amazing military career. Yes, he was wounded at the Battle of Trenton at That's 18 right. years old. That's right. But went on to serve uh, in the, in the Continental Army. Yes, and was at Valley Forge. Yes, and the Battle of Trenton. I don't know if, if you knew this or not, um, one interesting thing is he he's going ahead of the the group. He's kind of a recon unit in a way, and as he's going across, so he crosses the river first before George Washington. Even though there's a really famous painting of uh, oh, yeah. Emmanuel. Lance, I'm trying to go off my head, who paints it in the painting behind Washington is supposed to be Monroe, which is very inaccurate. It's a nice painting, but Monroe is already <laughs> across the river. So as Monroe's like scouting things out, he finds this doctor by the name of Riker. And he, Riker is a patriot, and he talks Riker into joining the group as a medic for this battle at, at Trenton. And once they are there, um, of course, Monroe picks up the bullet in his shoulder. It severs an artery, Whew. and Riker will actually tie that back together and save his life. So I actually, did not know that. Yeah, so actually wow. a doctor he recruits along the way for the cause to help them is the very man who saves his life. That is amazing. So I guess, again, you can see the providential hand of God. Yep. These little things, right, like God working the circumstances, something you'd never even think was going to be important. You pick up a medic. I mean, I guess it's always good at war to have be, <laughs> be friends with a medic, right? You pick up a medic, and then he ends up saving your life. And as you said, he's a lieutenant. And at the end of this, because of the bullet in the shoulder, which he'll carry for a while, um, he gets promoted to a captain at the age of 18. That's amazing. Yeah. That's that's, pretty, that's amazing. That's a pretty big promotion rank. You know, and, and uh, we were talking earlier before the podcast about how, you know, he, he was just a guy's guy. He, he was. was. An average person. He was average in every way. And uh, But he was brilliant at networking. Yeah. And I didn't bring the – there's a really famous quote. I didn't bring the book with me. Um where one of his biographers made the statement that he didn't have a great intellect, and they kind of actually make fun of him. Now, he wasn't, he wasn't dumb, but no. he was just average. When you compare him to Adams or oh, Jefferson, yeah. Yeah. right? But one thing they said is he made up for his lack of intellect with his courtesy, with his frankness, and with his just honest ability to communicate with people. And he was effective at it. Very effective. You know, and, and what's interesting, and, and I would love to see this happen today, but you never will, is that he could be at odds with somebody and then later on be in in, in partnership with yes. him. Yes. You know, uh, him and, you know, Madison, for example. Madison, you know, uh, in getting the Constitution uh, ratified, Monroe was against it. He yes, thought he, was. He, he didn't have a Bill of Rights. Mm -hmm. it, you know, it was way too strong mm -hmm. of central power. And he fought to keep Virginia from mm -hmm. ratifying it unsuccessfully. But then he comes back and, and realizes, you know, that he can be instrumental in getting the Bill of Rights passed, and they do. Yeah. And and uh, he he serves in Washington's uh, cabinet. Yes. Until Washington gets upset with him. <laughs> because he wasn't vocal enough. Yeah. yeah. And when yeah. he was over in France. And one of the reasons why actually this happens is because he's really good friends with Lafayette. During his time of war, um, I'm trying to remember which battle it was. I, I wrote this down, and I can't remember off the top of my head. It's been one of those mornings uh, where actually Lafayette gets wounded. Lafayette's young, working as a military officer. And Monroe actually aids him as they, as they escape, as they, as they move no through kidding. the flank. So because of this, he builds this great friendship with the French. So he's a very loyal man. Again, He's an average common, and he's not going to play the politics game. And I like that no, about yeah. him. Yeah, he's, he's, he's a very matter-of-fact kind of yes, person. Yes, he is. And, and, uh, but he's also very uh, valuable uh, in, in the uh, Jefferson administration. Yes. In fact, he was the one that was on the ground in France to negotiate the Louisiana Purchase. That's right. Which was originally mm -hmm. just going to be New Orleans. That's right. And some of West Florida later, and then they yeah. negotiated a little bit more, and then before long, we're picking up, yeah, doubling and, the and, size of the land. And he didn't have the authority no. uh, to, to buy it, and, <laughs> no. and he just was like, we're taking it. Yes. We'll take it all. Because Napoleon might rescind this offer later, yep. right? So $15 million. Let's yes. just buy the, you know, the, the other <laughs> half of the United States. Yes. Uh, speaking of Jefferson, Jefferson said this of Monroe, and I really like this. I thought this was a testament of who he was. Monroe was so honest that if you turned his soul inside out, mm -hmm. there would not be a spot on it. Yeah, I saw that. That's a cool quote, isn't From it? Thomas Jefferson. That, that's, About that's any powerful. politician. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> I mean, and, you know, it, he was a principled guy. Yes, he was. And, and it will take, for example, you know, in, what was it, 1808, uh, at the end of t uh, Jefferson's term, Madison's running for president. And Monroe runs against him. Yes. Monroe runs against him, mm -hmm. loses. Mm -hmm. And Madison understands the significance of, of how he can be for his administration. 
and he asks him to come join his his, his cabinet. Yes. Which I think is just brilliant. Yes. You know, and when we get to, to Lincoln and we talk about his, you know, his his cabinet of of, of, of um, adversaries or whatever it, it, it is, but this was a guy that that had value, and others of the opposite thought yes. realized that and wanted to keep him. Uh, on board with him. Well, he had learned that ability throughout his political career. He had served under the staff of Washington, yeah. Adams, and Jefferson. So he's worked with Federalists, Anti-Federalists. He's worked with pretty much everyone. And he's been on both sides of it. Yes. I mean, the guy, it's okay to change your mind. Exactly. It's okay to think again. It's okay to grow in your political philosophy as you keep studying and researching yep. and seeing ideas that don't work. And Monroeism, again, I love this about Monroe because we talk about this, this almost this pantheon of the founding fathers, right? You have Washington and you have Jefferson, you have Adams, and you come to Monroe and he's just, just an average dude. Yeah, right? he's the bridge. He's he the, is. He's the bridge that takes us from the founding fathers to the next generation of leaders. I like that. And it's 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 fascinating the way he does it because he 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 is not without controversy. No. He, he, he is a slave owner. Yes. And, of uh, course, the Missouri Compromise. The under Missouri his, Compromise, yes. which—, which Let's just talk about that for yes, a minute. Yes, we because need to. I think people have to understand that at the time of the Missouri Compromise, Missouri wanted to become a state, but they wanted to become a state, a, a slave state. Mm -hmm. And the federal government said, no, we're not, because every all the northern states outlawed slavery, and we're not going to allow another state to the Union that brings in slavery. Mm -hmm. and, and and there's this, this debate, there's this, uh, there's this, this, this kerfuffle, if you will. And finally, the <laughs> compromise is, well, what about Maine? Yeah. You know, Maine wants to become a state. Yeah. And, and I tell you what we'll do. We'll let Maine come in as a free state and Missouri come in as a slave state. Mm -hmm. And it's like, okay, okay. And that that was the compromise mm -hmm. that later in the Dred Scott decision was ruled unconstitutional. That's right. In interesting. And, That's and, right. And, and some of the worst decisions that came out of our Supreme Court were during that era mm -hmm. uh, of the Dred Scott decision. Mm -hmm. And 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 when you look at, well, how, how do we resolve that? Instead of going to the root of the problem, which slavery should be outlawed, <laughs> period, let's try to negotiate and rationalize why we can still bring in Missouri, because now we're going to bring in Maine, and that balances it out and everybody's happy. Mm. Everybody but the slaves were happy. Right, exactly. Imagine that. You know? and But, but going back to, to Monroe, you know, he supported, uh, I, I believe it was called the, the Colonization Society mm -hmm. in uh, Liberia, mm -hmm. and, and, and uh, where the, 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 the former slaves would, would go back uh, to Africa and create their own society. Mm -hmm. And they, in fact, they, he was so supportive that they called the capital of Liberia Monrovia. That's right. And, you know, That's right. again, it's this dichotomy of the founding fathers that say slavery's bad. All men are created equal. But, oh, except for we can't really do anything <laughs> about it. Well, I think one of the things we're seeing there um, is they knew they messed up. Yes. And how do we fix it now? Pass it on. Yeah, that's good. So the Colonization Act, obviously, I mean, you've, you've had generations now of African-Americans in America, so it doesn't work just to ship someone to Africa. That'd be like shipping me back to Ireland after, <laughs> after eight generations, yeah. right? Probably doesn't work no, that well. of course so, not. So how do we figure out how to make this work? And they, they kept trying to patchwork the problem instead of actually dealing with the root of the problem. One of the things I always tell my class is the Missouri Compromise stunted the growth of America in a huge way, too, because now agree. westward expansion could not take place because every state that comes in, we have to argue, is it a free state? Is We're it a slave, slave state? state. And it completely crippled westward expansion in America. Post-Civil War, Good point. the West opens up in a huge way, right? We Good have point. We have cattle drives. We have um, the, the meat packing houses in Chicago. We have the railroads. The entire America explodes in, in right. economic growth. And what, 13th what was, and 14th Amendment lay the predicate for that. Yes. And, and yeah, you're right. Up until that point, because of the Missouri We're Compromise. Handicapped. Yeah. So what we think is helping us economically, they're, they're holding slaves. It's the money, ca the human capital. It, it absolutely cripples the economy and the growth of America. Once that root of that evil problem is removed, the country itself actually expands both economically, geographically, yep. in every way. That is fascinating. Yeah. Remove that. It's, it's, uh, there's a biblical concept there, right? Get that, that yeah. problem sent out, and there's going to be some growth. And again, that's my pastor's heart coming out. But <laughs> That's okay. I mean, we're, we're going to... It's going to slip. That's okay. Um, but, but speaking of which, he also had a, a, a relationship with the Cherokee Nation. Yes, he did. And, and, and he was very supportive of the Cherokee Nation, yes, he was. Cherokee tribes in Georgia until the end of his presidency. That's right. And, 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 and that kind of set the... the, 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 the for Jackson coming after him? Yeah. Oh, my Lord. Yes. Yeah. And, and the Trail of Tears. Which we'll talk about Jackson, obviously, a lot more next week. But we have to remember, too, Jackson had been at war with Native Americans for years, and you dehumanize your enemies. 
So, I mean, when you've been at war fighting with that, that certain people group, you dehumanize them. Then now when you get the power to be over them, he should have been gracious, right? He should have been gracious in victory. He was not. So no, he we'll was get not. To him no, you're right. Next but, week. But as a result of Jackson's t- a- antics, the, the, there's, there's, there's more tension between the U.S. and Spain. Yes. Spain has Florida. Yes. And in and, and, and order to resolve that. Monroe oversees the purchase of yes, Florida what, for three, five million. Five million. Five, five million dollars. dollars. You can't yep. even get a beach house for that. No, Florida. not anymore. <laughs> right? I mean, jeez, good luck. The whole entire state. Five. And of course, this also leads to some Florida history: the Seminole Indian Wars. Yes. Because one of the things that's taking place this time is the Seminole Indians, which are the only Native American tribe that never signed a peace treaty with the government. I did not know that. Because they kept fleeing further and further south in the Everglades. Who wants to go to the Everglades to get them? (laughs) Mosquitoes, snakes, and now pythons. But nonetheless, back in the time. And casinos. And casinos. I mean, (laughs) you lose your money and your life now. Um, But back in these times, as they're heading further and further south, the Native Americans started taking freed slaves. And that's the reason why the Seminole Indians were using uh, freed slaves to build their roster. So the South, specifically Georgia, is losing freed slaves very, very quickly to Florida who are, who are joining these Seminole Indian tribes. And mm. they're saying, what are we going to do about this? And that's one of the things that motivated the purchase of Florida is let's get control of this leak where all these freed slaves are going to. So, again, interesting Florida history. It kind of begins to play out here. Right. That's not in the back of Monroe's mind by any means, but it's in the back of a lot of these Southerners' mind who, who ratify the idea of buying Florida. Right. So – and they do. And they do. And um, speaking of being an effective politician, uh, other than George Washington, we've never had a president yes. run on a post. Yes. His second, his second term, second election. Yes. No one runs against him. That's amazing. It's never happened except for, like you said, Washington, which, I mean, Washington's new. It's not like we even well, know the system yeah. yet. So really, in all honesty, we can say Monroe is one of a kind where his first election is so good the era of good feelings. Yes, you're right. That's what they call it. And then it. he runs the second time, and no one's like, man, we can't even run against him, right? We, we don't well, as you look at that. The, the, the kind of bookend. The election of the first founding father as president, unopposed. The election of the last founding father mm. you know, as president, unopposed. That's good. And it's, it's, it, it kind of bookends everything. Again, yeah. call it coincidence, call it what you want, but yes. it, it is rather fascinating um, when you look at his history. And, you know... The, the the Monroe Doctrine, which he came up with Good. when he was thinking about, you know, the the the, the Spain, the Spanish coming over and yes. t- wanting to more colonize more of the Western Hemisphere and and, and uh, South America, and he took a stand. Yes, which uh, we still support today. And it was very controversial at the time. It was a very lot of the founding fathers, including Adams, even was like, hey, this is not you can't basically call dibs on half the world. Yeah. However, we did, and it's paid off in a huge way. Exactly. And I think Theodore Roosevelt used it when, yes. you know, with the Spanish-American War and all of the— well, Let's know, fast forward all. even past that. Let's look all the way up to the Falkland Islands yeah. in the 1980s. You're right. Ronald Reagan, Reagan, Margaret Thatcher, right? They call it the political marriage, the Iron Lady and the great yeah. communicator. And yet now they're, they're kind of at war with each other because Margaret Thatcher says, hey, we're going to go get our islands— and Reagan's like, you're not going to do that. Monroe Doctrine. <laughs> this is our side of the world, right? Stay out. Stay out. <laughs> Interesting. So we as basically a country said all of the Western Hemisphere belongs to us. If you're not familiar with the Monroe Doctrine, all the Western Hemisphere belongs to us in the sense that no European power. Now, we don't mess with South American powers, but no European power can come and mess with any part of the Western Hemisphere. It was very controversial at the time, but in many ways, I think it saved us some additional wars. Oh, most definitely. Plus, it helped establish us as a superpower at the time. Absolutely. You know, that here we are still a a 30-year-old country, but yet we are taking the initiative initiative to say, don't tread on us. Yes. Don't come over here and yes. and and, and, uh, and we're willing to back it up. And so, you know, in fact, Monroe, who becomes James Madison Secretary of War at the time of the, the War of 1812, really does an effective job in, in building a military. Yes. Uh, building a navy. Yes. Uh, yeah, and, which was so needed. Yes. And it's interesting that he actually wanted the draft. Uh, none of the other founding fathers did, and they said, no, that's not going to work, not our ideas of liberty and freedom, which I totally get. And then he said, well, what we'll do is we'll offer in, in, in endorsements, we'll offer incentives to join the military. So he started giving free land, free homes, things of that nature. If you join the, the standing army, the standing navy, we're going to give you land, we're going to give you prospect land. And it actually really helped the recruitment of the military. And then at the same time, when these guys were coming out, now they're also beginning to settle wildlands. So it was a great policy that he puts in place. Uh, going back to the Monroe Doctrine, as we kind of, again, it's presidents and politics. As we look at this idea of modern politics, it's interesting that you see both China and Russia that are trying to gain territory in Central and South America. Yes. And one of the questions specifically with China is, does that violate the Monroe Doctrine? Because the Monroe Doctrine is, is targeted primarily at European powers, 
China being an Asian power now trying to gain territory in Latin America, how is that going to play out with our interpretation of the Monroe Doctrine? Well, that's a very good question, and we're very well aware of the Belt and Roads Initiatives that is in China. That yes. is China's economic investment plan for third world countries where they will come in and provide <laughs> the capital necessary to build the infrastructure – <laughs> and and in return, so it's more of a of a uh, a financial transaction yes. than it is an occupation. Mm. Until such time as as we're learning now that these third world countries cannot repay, right. and and then it becomes more of of a. Um, uh, an occupation, and that's what we have to be very concerned of, especially not only because they're going in and building these infrastructure, which gives them access to ports mm -hmm. and things of that nature, but they're also going. Uh, China is also going after raw materials, yes, and precious raw materials. Yes. And I think that you raise a very good point: is at some point, the, the United States is going to say, irrespective of what you call it, this is a violation of the Monroe Absolutely. Doctrine. Absolutely. Uh, because what is their intended purpose? Well, yes. we already know that China says we're going to be the next superpower yes. and we're going to overtake um, uh, the United States. Just last week, uh, them in Brazil decided that they're no longer going to use the, the United States dollar mm -hmm. as their reserve currency in mm -hmm. order to do their transactions. They're going to use the yuan. Mm -hmm. And it's like, whoa, their steps are already in there. And how long are we going to sit by and say, you know, the Monroe Doctrine is being trampled on here. Yes. We need to do something if we're going to stay together as a strong nation in the Western Hemisphere and protect yes. our allies. Well, imagine the strategic location <laughs> if you get somewhere like Guatemala, Belize, Nicaragua. These locations— Cuba. Cuba. I mean, we're what— 60 miles away from Key West. And now you start having bases for China. Now you start having military aircrafts and every that it's is happening. Uh, it is happening. The South China Sea. Research should... stations, weather stations. Yes, yes, yes. And balloons. Remember, remember oh, balloons? Right, you know, right, that yeah. wasn't too Did long that just ago. happen? Yes, yes, yes. I mean, very innocent. Um, so the Monroe Doctrine, I think, is very applicable. It's one thing I love about history. I always tell my students. You can't understand politics without history, right? Absolutely Like, we not. can't look at modern events unfolding out if we don't understand where these things happen. Like, this little guy over 200 years ago named James Monroe and the policies that he set up still establish the way we run our government today. Absolutely. And you cannot be an effective politician without understanding the founding of our country. And that's one thing I appreciate about with you is throughout your time in Congress, you always revered history and you use that as a guiding force. Oh, it's fascinating. It is. And I wish, wish we would teach it more. I wish we would yes. require it more. Yes. Just simple American history so you can understand that the people that were there at the time are really no different than the way we are today. And it's the same issues. It's all <laughs> The, the issues, man, they, it's, it's mm -hmm. the people come and go. The issues remain the same. Yes. You know, and, and but we need good people in this process. And when you go back and look at the first five founding fathers that were presidents of the United States, and you think, but for the grace of God. Yes. You know, the, these, these were the right people at the right time. And they were full of flaws. Yes, absolutely. Full of faults. And, 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 and yes, any one of them at any time probably could have... Uh, Abolish slavery mm. had, had, and, and, and probably should have. Yes. I, there's no excuse yes. for that. Agreed. But we eventually did. Mm -hmm. And it was the next generation. And it was a conflict. And it was a terrible conflict. But those conflicts will come again. Yes. But in this system that these gentlemen set up for all of us to follow gives us confidence and faith that we can overcome whatever those conflicts may be at ever what period of time in, 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 in the future that awaits us. Yes. And going back, you and I talked this before we started recording, um, but one thing that Monroe did very, very well is he networked. Yes. He wasn't the most intelligent. Uh, he wasn't the best looking. He wasn't the most eloquent. He, he didn't have the it factor that Hollywood right. has, right? But he was just a really kind, faithful, he honest was man of integrity, and he just showed up. <laughs> exactly. He was just consistent. He was consistent, and, and so many administrations yes. were always there, Yes. and they could always be relied upon. Yes. Uh, in fact, during one of uh, his military campaigns, he served, of course, in Valley Forge, as we yep. talked about, and he will actually share a tent with John Marshall. Who's I did the not know fourth that. justice? Yeah, yes. the fourth justice, of course, of the U.S. So everywhere he goes, he's showing up. He's kind. He's consistent, and then he just meets people, and he just. It's just there, and he's faithful. And people, people look back, and they're thinking of their administration. Oh, you remember Monroe? He was there. He was consistent. He was nice. Let's get him. I remember my dad, years and years later, talking about his, his, his high school, excuse me, his college graduation. And he said, the guy stood up to speak, and all he said was this, be nice. 
Learn how mm. to be kind in life. And he said, you know, 40 years later, I never forgot that. Be kind. And if we can teach our students just how to be civil, I know it's one of the big things that you're about, oh, yeah. how to be kind with people, it's amazing how many doors are open. Now, you're not kind for those doors to open, but if you're kind, it's amazing just how many things take place in life. And how disarming it can be in the most contentious situations. That's good. It is. It is. We don't need a frontal assault on everything, no. right? Some people, it's frontal assault for everything. It's like the patent mentality. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, 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 they, and it's supposed to be, uh, you know, evidence of weakness if you're kind. Oh, just the opposite. Opposite. That's right. It takes strength to be kind. That's right. And that's where it takes calculated strength to be yes. kind, and you could find out how well it works. And it is so hard to practice, and I <laughs> wish I could do it all the time. Agreed. And so does my wife. But <laughs> I, that being said, this was the kind of man that could be kind at the mm. right time in mm. order to get the object, objective accomplished. Yes, just I, consistent. Yep. And I, I think it's it's rather, you know, amazing that he dies too. Mm. On the Fourth of July, That's right. five years to the day that Jefferson and um, uh, and Adams had died, and you know, again, th- three of these five presidents <laughs> all die on the Fourth of July. Yes. Come on, come on. <laughs> so, this isn't Hollywood. Right? They couldn't write it as well as that. Right? Had that been written, uh, as George McCullough said, they would have yeah. said that was overdone. That was over the top. But it's reality. It is reality. I love this quote. I think you're going to like this. Uh, this is one of my my all time favorite quotes by Monroe. That always stands out to me. It is only when people become ignorant and corrupt, when they degenerate into a populace, that they are incapable of exercising their sovereignty. Wow. Are now we, think are about we, that. Are we treading on that today? I think we are. Yeah. I think we are. So when you become ignorant, when you become corrupt, you can no longer have a democratic republic. That's the time when, I mean, think about this even in in, in modern context. When a hurricane comes in Florida and there's looting, what's the first thing that happens? Martial law. People are too corrupt to actually be able to govern themselves. So now we come to a point that all of society is growing corrupt. We lose our ability to govern ourselves. And we create an ignorant society by failing to educate them. Yes. And we're doing that in the world of history. Yes. And in the world of civics. We are not educating them, and we're creating an ignorant population that will become corrupt. Yes. Think about these these men. They would read 1,500, 3,000, 4,000 books throughout their adult life. Yeah. They spoke Greek and Hebrew and French. They they were avid hunters. They knew the field. They were men of of just well-rounded knowledge in life. Mm -hmm. And then take your average American today. Mm. Statistics tell us that most college graduates, upon completion of college, can go up to 10 years before completing a book, actually reading a book upon their college graduation. That's a... I don't get that. I, I, I enjoy reading. Yes. I, 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 in fact, I, I'm building a little, little bit of a library. Yes. I enjoy American history. Uh, I enjoy biographies. And I, I can get lost in them, and I don't. I don't want to watch it on the TV. Mm. I don't even go to audiobooks, and I think they're great. They are. A lot of people do, uh, but I enjoy the written word, and I, I. I find it to help me just understand better. Yes, agreed. And I, I think as we look at that generation, maybe the reason why they led so well was because of the way they studied their mind, the well-roundedness of who they were. And we need a generation of men and women like that again. Amen to that. And as you said, I think education is key to that. Now, it doesn't always mean an expensive college education. No. I mean, I know we're filming this from Southeastern, right? But it doesn't always mean <laughs> that. There are times where it's, it's it's trade school. There are times there's other things. But the idea of a thirst for knowledge, of reading. That's what they had. Yes. They had it's self-education. Yes. They Monroe were, doesn't have a college degree, by the way. He yeah, goes right, to William right. and Mary, he does, and but he then the revolution out. breaks yeah, out. And dro- if you remember, he's part of the group of William and Mary who storm the governor's uh, mansion. And, 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 they yeah, the steal uh, swords, which yep. I mean, that's really going to help. They steal swords Williams and they steal third. guns, yep. and then they, they actually arm the Virginia militia from that. So that once they get out of the college of William and Mary, he never goes back. Right. So he has no college education, but he's well-read. He's educated. He knows politics. He speaks French. And he studies under Thomas Jefferson to become a lawyer. That's right. He studies under Jefferson, become a lawyer. So, yeah. again, there's not just one way of doing this. Self-determination, man. Yes, but we need that thirst for knowledge again. Yes. We need to build men and women who, if we can use the Old Testament term, men and women of renowned, right? Yeah, well put. That know, that know the, their scripture, they know their values, they know history, they know politics, they're well-read and they're ready to lead. We've got to do that again. So the question is, how do we do that? Well, what we're doing today. Yes, re-exposing people to these ideas. Yes. Of these founding fathers and, and, and challenging them, yes, you know, I mean, and, and 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 encouraging them, yes, and and recognize those who do this and 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 elevate them because this is the type of person that we need to be uh, cultivating to to be the next generation of statesman leaders. Agreed. 
And this has been James Monroe. Next week, Andrew Jackson. What a <laughs> fig- what a I mean, a war hero, right? Yes. But then when he comes to power, he does not relinquish yep. that idea of Yep. Old war. Hickory. Yeah, <laughs> and he was unbending in every way. So we will look at him next week. Looking forward to that. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed James Matt Monroe. Thank you.